All right. It, yeah, it's great to be here. This is my first time in person in, well, I don't know, but before the pandemic at least. So it's delightful to see familiar and friendly faces. And of course, once they finish that LRT, it'll all just be coming all the time because I actually live at Eglinton and Spadina. It'll be one uh, trip, uh, you know, direct thing straight across. <clears throat> um, so I know I can use the arrow keys, but uh, if I wanted to, so um, in terms of a pointer, it's built into the mouse, is that correct? Or just, or just like this, right? Is that it? Just use the cursor as a, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, that, that should work. Um, I was thinking about um, Ralph's uh, excellent talk about Australian eclipses, so I should, I should just mention, um, and I know Ralph knows this, and, and people who, who know their history will know that there was an eclipse in uh, 1922 that was visible from Australia, and Canadian scientists played an important role in going there and making measurements. So I have an article coming out that, that I've uh, co-written with my friend and colleague, um, Victoria Fisher, who is who looks after the scientific instruments collection at the University of Toronto, where they actually have uh, a lens that was used by Augustus Chant to watch the solar eclipse uh, and make measurements to test Einstein's theory. So that's gonna be published online in University of Toronto Magazine, so it'll be freely available, no paywall or anything, and that's coming out quite soon. So anyway, 101 years ago, Australia. Uh, I didn't go, unfortunately, to any of these Australian eclipses, but I, I wish I had. And Ralph has, I did the math, Ralph has been to just over five times as many total solar eclipses as me, but I've, I've been to an okay number, but I'm impressed with, with, uh, with Ralph's number. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about Edmund Halley. Um, now you know uh, the comet, of course, because everybody knows the comet depending on your age, but I think most people in the room are of approximately the age where this would apply, that you will remember what you were doing in the winter of 1985 slash 1986 when the comet came around the last time. And um, I see some heads nodding with the, the bright lights. It's a little hard for me to specifically see who's nodding and who's not nodding, but many of you are, are nodding your head. And, and I distinctly remember um, I was well, new-ish to astronomy, but I, I had, well, yeah, no, I already had uh, a small telescope, and I certainly had uh, my parents' binoculars and stuff, and I went out and saw Halley's Comet from Halifax in December, and it was quite disappointing, really. <laughs> it was very, very faint. And then we went to Florida, as we often did in early, very early spring, so I guess it was around March, and the view was better. Um, and, and it's funny, I had some of my old... I have my old 35 millimeter slides, and I was just looking at them the other day to see how bad the images were. And, and it's like, I mean, I've got a picture, you know, it's a star field, and, and it's labeled, in, you know, in my handwriting from the time, uh, Halley's Comet. It's like, where's the comet? I mean, I'm looking at this thing, holding it up to the light, and it's like, all right. But I did, I did see it in, in late 85 and early 86. Um, so I'm gonna talk, oh, I'm gonna, I didn't commit all this to memory, so I'm gonna occasionally that's, it's not my phone, right? Because my phone's over here and it's not making any noise, but something's alarming. Um, so Halley, of course, did much more than uh, find a comet. Um, he sailed to uh, St. Uh, Helena in the South Atlantic Ocean, which I'll talk about. Um, he worked on figuring out the size and shape of the Earth, as well as the size of the solar system. He mapped the Earth's magnetic field. He studied tides and monsoons. Uh, he tried to solve the problem of measuring longitude at sea, to name just a few of his uh, pursuits. So, um, just uh, this past spring, in, in May, uh, I walked in Halley's footsteps. I will, uh, okay, spoiler alert, I did not go to the South Atlantic. Um, I did not go to the island of St. Helena, but I did go to London and to Oxford, which is two-thirds of the battle, I guess. And, and I really, I do feel kind of privileged because um, some of you know I write articles for Astronomy Magazine and elsewhere. So for astronomy, I've profiled a number of dead astronomers, including Thomas Harriot and Tycho Brahe, and this time it's Edmund Halley, and it's, it's really just so much fun to do. And, and I love writing about dead people because it's just, I mean, you can, they're not gonna say that they don't like what you wrote, you know? Um, so it's, it, it really is something I, I enjoy. Um, yeah, so there's the lay of the land, London and Oxford in the upper left there. Um, Halley was born in 1656 in Hagerston. Where's Hagerston? It's a village 
at that time, it was a village just about a mile, a mile and a half northeast of the old city of London. But of course, today it is simply engulfed by the urban sprawl of London. So, and, and, and also we don't know which house in particular it was. So there, there is, as far as I know, there's no plaque or anything to indicate a particular place. So I, I didn't go to look for it because I figured there's nothing there to actually see. But, but this village of Hagerston would be just a little, you know, north and east of where King's Cross um, Railway Station is today. Um, so my starting point in terms of following in these footsteps would be the Royal Society, which you can see right, well, it's right there, the, oops, uh, left of, yeah, just there. Um, <clears throat> uh, right in the center of Westminster, right in the, you know, couldn't be any closer to stuff. You're sort of in between Buckingham Palace and, and Trafalgar Square. Um, now, uh, let me see, where am I? Oh, yes. Uh, the Royal Society, let's go to this picture here. Um, on Carlton House Terrace, of course, it's moved around a number of times uh, over the years. Um, it dates actually from 1660, when it was granted a royal charter by King Charles II. Um, Halley was elected a fellow of the society in 1678 and would later take on the role of secretary. Um, so as a journalist, and this is again sort of one of the really fun parts of my job, is I email somebody there and say, look, I'm going to be in London. Um, uh, some Googling told me that they have two of the five known portraits of Halley, and could I drop in? And they said, oh, yeah, you can come and we'll show you the portraits. Um, <clears throat> so one of them is on, oh, actually, uh, just uh, the, neither of these are Halley. That's, uh, Stephen, that's Stephen Hawking on the left and biochemist uh, Gene Thomas on the right. I guess this is sort of a, you know, a tea, tea room. Uh, it's just kind of a cool place to visit. I kind of wish I worked there, maybe had a fellowship to hang out there, but oh well, I was just there for one for one afternoon. Um, so they take me up to the second floor and show me the portrait of, I guess, what, what just what I affectionately call old Halley to distinguish from young Halley, which you'll see in a minute. Um, and, and here he is looking, I guess I would just say a little grumpy, but uh, you know, he's He's, he's getting on in years by this point, and uh, he's holding on, on a sheet of paper there some of his work on, well, it's a little hard to tell, but I guess something involving celestial, celestial bodies. Um, but uh, I, I say to the, the librarian fellow who's showing me around, um, you have a portrait uh, of, uh, of young Kelly. Where, where's that? And he says, oh, that's, that's in storage. I, well, why, why is it in storage? Well, they just have so many awesome things there, and it's a limited amount of wall space, so not everything can be out on display. But he says, don't worry, I'll go, I'll go and fetch it for you. I just wait here. So I just wait here, and he, he brings it out, leans it against a cabinet or a wall, and there's, there's young Hallie. Now, of course, this picture is, like, it's not a secret that it exists, so if you do a Google image search, you will find it, so it's, it's a little easier to see as per Google image than it is in real life. Um, but there he is. Uh, so this is pre So in the, in the previous one, uh, sorry, that's, yeah, in the previous one, of course, he's wearing a wig. Uh, but this is, uh, as I understand it, his own actual uh, hair. Um, I don't know at what age they, they, it becomes mandatory to put on the wig, or, or I don't know how that works. But, uh, but there he is. Um, and let's see. OK, now, we don't know, unfortunately, we don't know too much about his, um, his personal life. Um, we know that um, uh, he, he took a keen interest in, in math and astronomy uh, and enrolled in 1673 at Queen, the Queen's College in Oxford, uh, where he would later return uh, as civilian professor of geometry. Um, as a student, oh, okay, so there's yeah, the university, just some pictures from around town. Some of you, I'm sure, have been to Oxford. It is a wonderful place to visit, great place to be a tourist for a day. I love the fact that there's a little street called Logic Lane, and I know I've, I've taken the same photo on different visits, but I just, I think Toronto should have a, a Logic Lane somewhere. Um, so yeah, he lived, uh, or as a student, he probably lived uh, on campus, so to speak, in the Queen's College one of the older, there are, there are older ones, but this one dates from 1341. Now, of course, these buildings that you're seeing in the picture do not date from the 14th century. They date from the 18th century, which is why they have that sort of much more, much newer neoclassical look to them. So, so these buildings post-date Halley's time there. I don't exactly know what the college looked like in Halley's time, but it was probably very elegant, and I'm sure there was lovely green space and that sort of thing. Um, so that's where he was as a youngster. 
And then he came back as a professor at which point he was given this house that I think, I think just, it comes with the title. When, when they elect you civilian professor of ge geometry, you get to live there, I think, as, as I understand it. So that's his house. And I, I've been to Oxford previously, but what's new this time uh, from my last visit is that they've added that little plaque, which I'll now show you a close up of. So that, that's new, the plaque that says his name, his dates, and of course, a little, little picture of a, of a comet. Um, and then, sorry, just going back to the previous picture, Supposedly, uh, according to what I've read, um, he made he conducted observations from the roof, and that little thing that sticks up at the top in the middle. Well, I mean, I don't know what's in there now. But who, who knows? But it 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 did at one point uh, serve as his observatory. I mean, it probably it must have looked a little bit different um, in Halley's time. But uh, that's just kind of cool to think that he was up there, you know, in the middle of the night, um, probably disturbing the people around him and stuff, and making noise and uh, looking at the stars, which, and, and I'm sure Britain was much less light polluted then than it is, um, than it is today. So while still an undergraduate, um, he published a couple of papers on, on the solar system and on sunspots. He wrote to John Flamsteed, who was the first uh, astronomer royal, uh, to alert Flamsteed to mistakes that Halley had found in, in published tables on the position of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and also mistakes that he found in star positions published by uh, Tycho Brahe. So even as a, as a youngster, he was making a bit of a name for himself. Um, as I say, we don't, we don't know too, too much about his personal life. We, he did marry a woman named Mary Took, or Took, T-O-O-K-E, in 1682. We know that they had two daughters, and the marriage lasted 54 years until, until Mary's death. Um, and he, whoops, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and he spent some time on the high seas. He was a bit of an adventurer in that regard. Um, <clears throat> so in 1676, not long after his 20th birthday, uh, he sailed to the remote volcanic island of St. Helena. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, the southernmost piece of land under British rule. Um, and he was determined to accurately chart the southern stars, which had not been done up to that point. Um, now, uh, well, what, so what went wrong? I mean, most, I mean, he did eventually succeed, but the weather there was dismal, it turned out. Uh, he tried to observe both a solar and lunar eclipse in the spring of 1677, and he was clouded out on both occasions. He did have better luck with the transit of Mercury, which he observed in 16, also in the fall of 1677. But he persevered, and he did eventually, ah, okay, these are just some of his his chart, charts, uh, the one on the left you already saw as part of my title slide. I like the one on the right, which is, I just love the amount of detail in it because you know, you're seeing Cornwall and Devon and the southern half of Wales and bits of Ireland and it's just, I just like the, uh, the look of it. Um, ah, yes, and this is just lifted from Wikipedia, but uh, these are, uh, what is it, iso, how do you pronounce that anyway? Isogonic, isogonic, I mean, one of you folks must know how to pronounce that, anyone? <laughs> Isogonic, okay. So isogonic lines of equal magnetic declination. And the, the gist of it here is that, you know, a, a compass magnet um, points to the north magnetic pole, which is different from the north geographical pole, and you, you have to know what that difference is uh, or you'll get lost as you're sailing around the globe. So this is something that had to be uh, charted. Oh, okay, and just another map, again, lifted from the internet, obviously, showing where he went. And um, uh, again, some, some Googling uh, tells me that, uh, of course, he stopped uh, near, very close to St. John's, Newfoundland, and that the RASC in 1994 put up a little plaque to mark the spot. Now, d does anyone know, like, can anyone just say that, yes, that's correct, and they did that? I mean, Ralph, you must know this, or, yeah. I think that's correct. They had the... Uh... RASC General Assembly about 10. Okay. Okay, cool. Because I know they also put up a plaque to mark John Winthrop's uh, visit there to view, that was a transit of Venus, right, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and uh, this is, uh, of course, a different occasion, but also very plaque, plaque worthy. So at any rate, uh, it's just, I mean, you, would, you just may not necessarily think that Edmund Halley had anything whatsoever to do with Canada, but there you go. He, he got off his boat, at least for a little while, near, near uh, what's now St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, let me just see here. Um, 
Oh, yeah, the catalog of the Southern Star. Yeah, here it is. Uh, he persevered, eventually succeeding, it succeeded in charting the Southern Sky, uh, returning to England the following spring, and his catalog would be called the, I can't really say it in Latin very well, but Catalogus Stellarium Austra Australium, basically just a catalog of the stars of the South. Um, he did have further, he, he, did, he went on multiple voyages, so he had a few different ad adventures. Um, at one point, Again, in the far south of the Atlantic, uh, his crew spied uh, three unusually flat, treeless, uh, quote, islands um, that were, uh, as he described it in his log, quote, covered with snow, milk white, with perpendic perpendicular cliffs all around them. Uh, these were not islands, these were icebergs that he had found. Um, and in due course, uh, fog descended and the, his ship almost became trapped in the ice, and that would not have been a good thing at all. But uh, they were able to escape northward, eventually reaching the island of Tristan de Cunha, another very remote island in the South Atlantic, uh, where Halley was able to, quote, recover the warm sun who we, who we had not seen for a fortnight. So I'm actually kind of glad I was not there. Um, an intriguing episode, uh, oh, okay, here's some lovely stamps uh, from St. Helena showing, just sort of commemorating um, Halley and his, his doings uh, down there. Now, um, the, uh, there's a meeting, uh, very famous, and so I know, you know some of you know this, I'm sure, but um, uh, Halley, uh, um, Halley and Newton uh, met up um, and talked about, I did a Google image search as, as one does, and I just, there, I, I thought there would be a whole bunch of images of the two to choose from, but I, I really just found these two, but that's all right. This, this gives you an idea, or a, a caricature at least, of what was going on. So, so what happened? So um, Halley and Newton, you know, independently, had both been thinking about the motions of planets and moons and comets. Um, so Halley, uh, I want to say, you know, hops on the train, but of course they didn't have trains at that point, so he took the, the, the carriage, uh, pulled by horses, up to, to Cambridge uh, from London to chat with um, Newton and asks him, so I know you've been thinking about this, suppose you had um, a force that fell off with the square of the distance, as we would say today, a one over r squared force law, what would be the resulting motion of the object around the other object? And uh, Newton says, Oh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. You know, I've thought about that. In fact, I did the calculation. In fact, I've got the calculations right here. Oh, my goodness, where did I put those papers? Gosh darn it, I can't find them. But don't worry, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to redo the calculations, and I'll, I'll let you know. I'll send you a letter. I'll let you know what I find. Um, so, so Newton uh, gets to work again on this project, publishes uh, a short little work called Demotu, and then a longer work that everybody knows because it's very famous, his, his Principia. And that finally comes out in 1686. So how much credit goes to Halley? Well, you know, it's hard to say. But, but Halley, I mean, the, the, you know, it's hard to separate the, the, the lore from the, the actual sequence of events, but uh, Halley is seen as being like the instigator, the, the person who nudged uh, Newton to actually you know, get off his rear end and, and set this thing down. Because Newton was actually kind of a, a private individual and, I mean, kind of a little different from today. Because today, people publish, you know, people, everybody wants to publish, even people who have, like, really bad ideas want to publish them really, really quickly and get the word out. But Newton was kind of a recluse and had to be kind of um, uh, nudged to, uh, to actually do it. And, of course, now the Principia is one of the, one of the um, you know, keystone books in the history of science. Um, <clears throat> so, a few words about the comet here depicted in 1066. Actually, on the same trip, uh, I mean, it's just kind of a coincidence that this is the case, but my travels started in, in Paris, so, and I was with my brother for this part of the trip, uh, we hopped on a train and did this little side trip to Bayou, and I, I saw the tapestry in, in all its glory. It, it's in a, you know, a nearly pitch dark room uh, with very dim lights, so it's not to damage it, et cetera, et cetera. But if, it, and if you have a chance to visit Bayou, it's, it's just such a cool thing to see uh, with your own eyes. Um, okay, so uh, Halley and his comet. Um, in the fall of 1682, Halley is carrying out a series of observations of this comet that would eventually come to bear his name, and he concluded that the object that he observed that November was the same object that had been seen in 1531 
and 1607. So he does a bit of math, he concludes that the comet, must, must, that the comet must be moving in an orbit with a period of roughly 75 years, um, predicting that it would return in 1758, which it did right on schedule, though of course, unfortunately, Halley did not live to see that. But the return of Halley's comet, um, and again, there's, there's a danger of descending into sort of cliche and stuff, but, but I, I do like to think of it as a pivotal moment um, where, where science was just really coming into the fore because comets had been objects that were feared, right? I mean, Shakespeare wrote about them. Uh, if you saw a comet, it meant probably that something terrible was gonna happen, that you were about to lose a battle. Of course, that means it was a good omen for the other guys who were gonna win the battle. But you, anyway, you see, there, there were thought to be these, these things that were mysterious and, uh, and you know, very significant. And after this point, it's like, okay, we've got an explanation rooted in physics and mathematics and you know they've been uh, comets have been tamed so to speak so i just think that's you know it's I, again i'm not a historian so i'm not a historian and historians don't like it when you point to such and such and say now this is a turning point cuz they'll tell you that in fact it was very gradual or whatever but i, I like to think of it as a, as kind of a, a key a key moment um, so halley was named astronomer royal in 1720 oh here's a little map of uh, greenwich and uh, it also shows Blackheath, which is the neighborhood just below Greenwich, uh, where the, the tomb is, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, shortly. Um, yeah, okay, there's the, the Royal Observatory, Greenwich. Um, <clears throat> oh, actually, now it was a little cloudy on the day that I was there. I mean, I've been there a number of times over the years, but it was clou cloudy in 2023. But this is, uh, my friend Roger Highfield took this photo. Just, I'm showing this to prove that the sun does sometimes come out in, uh, in Greenwich. Um, okay. So uh, let's see, yeah, so following the death of Flamsteed, the first astronomer royal, Halley is appointed to the position. Uh, he goes up the hill and he finds that in fact, it had been stripped of all its instruments by um, Flamsteed's wife, Margaret, uh, arguing that while well, Flamsteed had paid for the instruments himself, so they were his. Um, and then, you know, so she could whatever, sell them or do something with them, but they, you know, they're not, they don't, you know, they're not public property, uh, they're, they belong to the family. So Halley eventually persuaded the government to pay him an extra 500 pounds uh, to acquire new equipment. Uh, but there are other issues, which is that um, <clears throat> Flamsteed had, had mounted his mural arc, which is uh, kind of a quadrant like, well, I'll just go to the next, oh, okay, well, uh, the, the, the notes and the slides are not perfectly synced up, but that's life. Um, I'll, let's go here, yeah, that's Halley's mural arc, and I'll, I'll go back to the other thing in a minute. Um, so there was a device like this that had been built by Flamsteed, but it was mounted on a brick wall, and that brick wall was slowly sinking into the ground. Um, so that's a problem, because it's also, amongst other things, it's sort of defining the, the zero point of, of longitude. So um, Halley, uh, you know, with the, this uh, government funding, uh, gets his, builds his new eight-foot mural quadrant, you're seeing it there in the, in the image, um, and, and, you know, he, puts it on a sturdier uh, slab and, and it doesn't sink into the ground, so that's good. But if you if you visit this room, so this is called the transit room, uh, for obvious reasons, I guess, in, in uh, at Greenwich, uh, but one thing that I noticed, and, and again, I've been there previously, but I, I guess I just wasn't paying enough attention on previous visits, but what, what I noticed this time is um, there are basically three prime meridians, uh, and why is that? Now, only one is the, you know, the brass line that extends out onto the plaza where the tourists all have their photo taken. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in the actual transit room, you see three lines marked on the floor. So why is that? Well, it's because every time they uh, elect a new, not every time, but just about every time a new astronomer royal comes in, they, they, they install a fancier transit device that, you know, that looks at the, um, you know, tracks objects that they, as they pass through the local meridian, the highest point in the sky that they're gonna get. Um, and so, so you can't, you can't, you don't wanna just take down the, the existing one, so you just build a new one. And the tradition that got established was you just build it uh, six or eight or 10 feet uh, to the east. Um, so you just say, all right, this is the new, this is the new prime meridian, here we go. My, my device, new prime, prime meridian. And you're thinking, oh my God, how can you change the prime meridian? Well, you can change it anytime you like. So it's not like the equator, right? The equator is an actual, well, so, somewhat of an actual thing, like you, you can't decide to put it somewhere else because um, it has to do with the Earth's, uh, it's defined by the Earth's axis. But the, the prime meridian of longitude is a convention. It's wherever you decide, it's wherever you say, 
you know, where the person with the most clout says it's going to be. So Flamsteed put it there, and then Halley puts it here, and then, let's see, I think Bradley comes along. Yeah, Bradley, who is Halley's successor, puts it a few feet to the east, and then finally uh, Sir George Airy comes along and puts another one in, and, and that's the one where they said, yep, we're done. Like, this is going to be it. And the brass line where the tourists take their photos is lined up with uh, Bre uh, sorry, with Aries um, transit instrument. But one more piece of trivia along, and I, I didn't at all time this, so somebody can wave at me when I'm down to my last five minutes, but uh, I'll, I'll hopefully not go over time. But there is actually yet another prime meridian because modern GPS systems use another imaginary line about 300 feet further east, and that's the International Reference Meridian, or IRM. And why it doesn't line up with Aries, I don't know. So. Don't don't ask me that during the Q and A, but there's I'm sure I mean there, I'm sure there's a really good reason why it's 300 feet further east. Um, Halley held the position until his death uh, at the age of 85. And going back now to this one, so this is and I'll go back even further a second because you're wondering what is this? Well, this is this is Halley's original gravestone mounted up vertically on a wall, but you can also see it here. So it's actually just. I'm gonna I'm gonna struggle a bit with oh well, I've lost the cursor altogether. Well, it doesn't matter. It's in the upper photograph, uh, four fifths of the way to the right. You can see this little vertical slab of rock. It's it's not a door to the camera obscura. It's just it's a slab of it's a, it's a gravestone. It's the original gravestone of Edmund Halley, um, and a, with a little explanatory plaque. So what's going on? Well. Um, Halley uh, is buried at the church of St. Margaret's Lee. I might as well go forward to that. Yeah. Um, and uh, after however many, I don't know, a century or more, um, the gravestone was in such poor repair that they, they took the original gravestone uh, and put it up at Greenwich and then had a sort of replacement one put him here in here. But ironically, the replacement is far more weather beaten than the original. So the original is actually just about legible. And this one, my friend and I stared at it for a good length of time. And you can make out certain words, but it's in, it's in quite poor shape. Um, but visiting the grave was really a bit of a mini adventure in its own right, um, because St. Margaret's uh, Lee, and, and again, uh, it's a, you can sort of tell by looking at it, it's, it's a newer church, the, the original church. Uh, I forget if it burned down or was or just fell apart or whatever, but the newer building dates only from the 19th century. But the church has sort of two cemetery areas, and this part um, is usually behind. It's, there's a, a gate, and it's it's generally locked. It's not generally open to the public. So again, I you know did some googling, sent an email, and and literally you know the church lady came to meet me that day and said, oh, you're a journalist from Canada, welcome, and unlocked the gate, and my friend and I went in, and uh, and it's just kind of cool to see, and, it, and it's kind of sad that it's in poor repair, um, but there is Halley's grave in all its, uh, in all its glory. Uh, the text uh, is partly in, in Latin and partly in English, but the critical part reads, um, beneath this gravestone, Edmund Halley, unquestionably the most eminent of the astronomers of his age, rests pe peacefully with his dearest wife, as he was a man so greatly cherished by his fellow citizens during his lifetime, so let a grateful posterity venerate his memory. And in all, there are five members of Halley's family buried there, along with J John Pond, who was another uh, astronomer royal. And in, and in fact, nearby in the same cemetery is yet another astronomer royal, N Nathaniel Bliss. So there's a lot of astronomers in this place. Um, but it's interesting, and I don't know all the details here, but by the time that John Pound died, Halley had already been dead for about a century, so I don't know how he worked that, but somehow he must have told people, like, when I go, stick me in there. I want to be in the, in the grave with, with Halley, and, and I, I mean, I, I just don't know how one goes about negotiating that sort of thing, but that's where he is. Um, and because his inscription is the more recent of the inscriptions, it's actually the most legible, so it's a bit easier to read that um, pond is in there than it is to make out that that Halley is in there. Um, and that's almost it. Oh yeah, so there's the ruins of the original church, which as you can see is a, is a much a much older style of building from what's from the little bit that's left of it. Oh, and actually this is kind of neat. And, and you know, I, I was in there, uh, as I say, my friend and I were in there for probably 90 minutes at least, because I'm, you know, taking photos from every conceivable angle. 
And uh, then, then she says, you know, isn't it kind of weird that there's this, you know, there's these condominiums like perched right up at the edge of the, of the cemetery. It's like, yeah, you're right. That is kind of, I mean, not that, you know, I mean, London's a crowded city and real estate is at a premium. And I don't know if there are apartments or condos, but it's obviously residential. And it's just kind of funny that you could, if you lived there, you could literally look down at Edmund Halley as you were having your morning coffee. Um, and I, I hope the people who live there do, you know, appreciate that. Um, maybe they do. I, I have no idea. I didn't try to knock on the door because that would be weird. But um, I just think that's uh, kind of interesting. Um, so, uh, so that's where his mortal remains are. But, but they're in Westminster Abbey, and I, di I didn't go, but I've seen it on, on previous visits. But there is a, um, a plaque uh, commemorating him uh, not far from the grave of Newton, and of course Hawking is there, and Charles Darwin is there, and a bunch of folks. And um, let's see, I can, I know the print, yeah, it's probably too hard to read the small print, and I have to go like this to read it. I'll, I'll just speak up. Um, so it says, first to predict the return of the comet named after him, second astronomer royal, fellow and secretary of the Royal Society, sponsor of Sir Isaac Newton's Principia, editor of Philosophical Transactions, civilian professor of geometry, Oxford, oceanographer, meteorologist, geophysicist, inventor, navigator, and f famed for his researches in determining longitude, he laid the actuarial foundation of life insurance. And I didn't even talk about that last item because it's not as interesting, but, but that is a long list of accomplishments. So at any rate, he did a lot of stuff beyond just looking at that one comet. And just on a final note, the comet, is uh, this December, it's coming up on aphelion, which means it's gonna be as far away from our part of the solar system as it gets. And at that point, it'll be some 25 astronomical units or nearly two and a half trillion miles away, way out beyond the orbit of Neptune, but it will be back. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for sharing the historical perspective with us. Very interesting. Uh, any questions for Dan? Okay, we've got one over here. Just in that um, picture of that memorial there, what's that gizmo right in the middle of the um, round disc? It looks like a satellite to me. Yeah, it, that's a great question. Um, I, I hadn't thought about that at all, uh, because again, I didn't actually look at the plaque on this visit. I would have seen it some years ago when I was there in the Abbey. Uh, I guess it would be the Herschel Observatory. Can anyone just, I mean, I don't know if anyone's a really... F So does anyone know what, what, I mean, if, but how is that connected to Halley? Oh, in, in, in 1986. Okay. Oh, microphone, yeah. <laughs> the spacecraft Giotto that looks like an acorn in the middle of there. I think that's what that is. One thing I was thinking when I saw the image uh, a couple of it, different images, including the plaque that you showed at the beginning of your talk, of Halley's Comet. Halley is not known for drawing Halley's Comet, but Giotto is. He was the artist who painted Halley's Comet, and that's why they named the spacecraft after it. That's very cool, yeah. Because No, thank you for that. Because I, I would have just imagined, like, I mean, I hadn't thought about it, but why wasn't the spacecraft just called um, Halley or something like that, right? Which... I guess almost almost too obvious. I guess. Uh, okay. Yeah. That, thank you. Uh, yeah. That's. I've I've learned something. I'm I'm glad I came today. <laughs> learned something. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions uh, for Dan? No, no, no. no. Nothing online either. Okay. Good. So we're gonna wrap it up. Thanks again, Dan. Appreciate it. Yeah.